Hi everyone and welcome to my channel. For those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Tiffany and I upload a new homemaking video every Sunday. I feel like my channel needs a video about Emily Post. I read Emily Post's book on etiquette a couple of years ago and I really enjoyed it. This is the 1937 edition. The book was originally published in 1922 um, and it's still being updated, I believe, today. So I wanted to share with you some of my findings in this fun little book. I was expecting to read this and find it full of pretension and silly rules, and it is full of some silly rules that no longer apply to our society. But there were some little pearls of wisdom, and I really appreciate where she was coming from when she wrote this book. So I'm gonna share with you some of the things that I found that were valuable. So this will be part story time and part book review, I guess. I'm going to start by reading you a little paragraph from chapter one, The True Meaning of Etiquette. And I'm hoping this will make her intention clear and help you understand why I found this book to be a little bit valuable. Considering manners, even in their superficial aspect, no one, unless he be a recluse who comes in contact with no other human, can fail to reap the advantage of a proper, courteous, and likable approach, or fail to be handicapped by an improper, offensive, and resented one. And certainly the greatest asset that a man or woman or even a child can have is charm. And charm cannot exist without good manners. Meaning by this, not so much manners that precisely follow particular rules as manners that have been made smooth and polished by the continuous practice of kind impulse. Kind impulse, that is really what stuck out to me. I enjoy that concept. I think it's important to go about daily life with an intention of being kind to people. And I do my best at that. I fail miserably sometimes, but at least I have that in my mind to keep trying and reaching for. Um, so I wanted to share it with you before I get into the other aspects of this book I wanna share. The first helpful thing that I came across was in chapter 10, words, phrases, and pronunciation. This section was very helpful for me because I'm always trying to make my language simpler and it was nice to get a reminder of why I do that and why I feel like I need to continually be simplifying my language. I enjoy this little story time setup, it's kind of fun. To be able to separate best English from merely good English needs a long process of special education. But in order to recognize simple, direct, and beautiful speech from that which is redundant and pretentious, one need merely see whether the same thing might be said in shorter, simpler Anglo-Saxon form. For example, if you say, I desire to purchase, you could say instead, I would like to buy. Or, will you accord me permission? Instead, you could say, will you let me or may I permit me to assist you? You could say, let me help you. And the last one I want to share with you is, partook of liquid refreshment. You could just say, I had something to drink. I appreciate this so much. And she has a lot more examples, but I don't want to take up too much time here. <laughs> and I just thought this was so fabulous because how many times have you tried to put together somebody's complicated sentence? And sometimes that's really fun if you're coming at it from like a vocabulary game sort of way. But if you're trying to sound like a big deal, it's exasperating for the people around you. So I'm constantly editing and deleting words. And I guarantee I've deleted 90% of what I just said here so that I don't waste too much of your time either. <laughs> the next section that stood out to me is chapter 11, making one's position in the community. I think this part resonated with me because when I was reading this book, I had just moved into my house. I was in a new neighborhood and I was still relatively new to the area I live in now. I hadn't really made a lot of friends and it was important to me to try and build friendships and acquaintances with my husband's friends as well. So this is just a fun little way to do that and I think she illustrates a really charming picture of how to make friends when you're in an area that you're significant other is from or is acquainted with, but you're not. So this section is called 
the assets of informal friendliness. Let us now consider your own personal situation. Let us say you are a typically capable young woman interested in making your new home as beautiful as you can. You are naturally eager to get it all in order, not only for him and for you, but as a background against which you expect to receive his friends. But now let us say that long before you are ready for visitors, his friends become, begin coming to see you. What you do now is very important. If you shut your door until you are in order, you will lose a real opportunity. Therefore, in case you find it hard to be unselfconscious in greeting total strangers from the heights of a stepladder, or from behind a barricade of curtain material, or in the midst of whatever you are engaged in, remember that you could not set the scene better if you planned it. If you'll think about it, you'll realize that finding you in the midst of a homely occupation makes a far more friendly appeal to anyone capable of friendliness then finding you in your living room and both you and your house are in perfect order for company. In the latter case, the strangers who call upon you say pleasant things about your husband and hope perhaps that you will like their town. But their point of view is rather formal and at the end of 15 minutes or so, the same strangers who came politely into the room go politely out of it. In short, you have been talking with two persons with whom you have begun a polite acquaintance. Ew. But now let us draw the other picture, in which case you are caught in a paint patterned smock, a paint pot in your left hand and a brush in your right. And the object of your decoration, whether it be wall or furniture, half dingy and half colorful, the fact that words visitors and hostess in no way fit into the situation changes the entire atmosphere. And before you know it, you are showing two neighbors all the objects that you have painted or intend to paint, the material that you are going to use to slip cover this ugly sofa, and the curtain material you are going to sew, and before they know it, they are giving you their best advice, which perhaps you follow or perhaps you don't. In any event, by the time they go, they seem like friends, and probably they soon become just that. That's such a great way to make friends, and I love the idea of a welcome wagon in a neighborhood anyway. We had one in our neighborhood. We had so many neighbors coming by to welcome us, and they brought us wine and some little gifts, and it was just so lovely. So. That is definitely a great way to make friends. Highly recommend once we're allowed. The next section I want to share with you has to do with dress. I struggle with this. I have always struggled with this. I have a sister who is impossibly chic. She always knows how to put herself together perfectly and I don't understand how she does it, but she's great at it. And I always wonder what her secret is. I still haven't figured it out, but I think I found some solid direction in this book. I think she has some good advice on how to figure out how to dress yourself. The woman who is really chic. <clears throat> the woman who is chic is always a little different. Not different in being behind fashion, but always slightly apart from it. Chic is a borrowed adjective, but there is no English word to take the place of elegant, which was destroyed utterly by the reporter or practical joker who said elegant dresses, and yet there is no syn synonym that will express the individuality of beautiful taste combined with personal dignity and grace which gives to a perfect costume an inimitable air of distinction. I have to look up the word inimitable. The woman who is chic gets the latest model perhaps, but has it adapted to her own type so that she has just that distinction of appearance which the sheep lack. But the average would-be independent who determines to stand her ground saying, these new models are preposterous, I shall wear nothing of the sort, and keeps her word, soon, soon finds herself not at all an example of dignity, but an object of derision. I think that's smart. I get that. She goes on to explain how it's important to be realistic about what you look like and who you are in order to find what suits you so that you can be chic and make the most out of your appearance, which I thought was really helpful. I think for me personally, there's always a mismatch between what I actually look like and what I look like in my head. Sometimes they don't match and it makes it hard for me to determine what I'm going to be comfortable wearing in public. So um, I'm interested in figuring this out over the next year or so. And I've had a lot of fun putting together my spring wardrobe and sharing it on social media. Um, you can follow that if you follow me on um, Instagram at Tiffany Collection Home. But that was really helpful advice and maybe it'll, it'll help you with your fashion journey too. It's important how we present ourselves, you know? The next section I wanna to talk to you all about is a little bit of a downer, but I'm gonna bring you back up at the end of this video, I promise. Um, but the next section I wanna talk about is funerals and how to support people who are grieving. I think this 
is the most valuable chapter of this book. And if you only read one chapter of it, because this is a huge book, look, look at it. But it, the chapter on funerals was really helpful for me. Fortunately, I haven't lost anybody in that time, but I do know that we will all experience that in our lifetime. And I know it's nice to have a guide for what to do when you don't know what to do. That being said, I'm going to read you this section on first aid to the bereaved. First of all, the ones in sorrow should be urged, if possible, to sit in a sunny room where there is an open fire, if there is cold or even nearly cold weather. Occasional offerings of food should be taken to them on a tray, such as a cup of tea or coffee or bouillon with thin toast, a poached egg, milk if they like it hot or milk toast, or for an older person, a milk punch or eggnog with a biscuit. Cold milk is bad for one who is already chilled. It is better for some to eat as often as possible since the activity of digestion helps to banish the symptoms of panic or collapse. It sounds paradoxical to say that those in sorrow should be protected from all contacts, and yet it is the worst thing possible to leave them much alone with their own thoughts. Also, they must be asked about the details of the funeral, when they would like it held, whether in a church or at the house, whether they want special music or flowers ordered, and where the interment is to be. This next section is called The House Restored to Order. While the funeral cortege is still at the cemetery, someone who is in charge at home must see that the mourning emblem is taken off the bell and any furniture that has been displaced is put back where it belongs. Unless the day is hot, a fire should be lighted in the living room to make a little more cheerful the sad homecoming of the family. It is also well to prepare hot tea or broth and it should be brought to them upon their return without their being asked if they would care for it. Those who are in great distress want no food, but if it is handed to them, they will naturally take it, and something to stimulate impaired circulation is what they need most. I think that's really helpful advice. This whole chapter is long, but it's definitely the most valuable one to read, just because there are a lot of tips on what to do when you don't know what to do, and it'll help you support someone who really needs you. The next and final little section I wanna to talk to you about is called The Wedding of a Cinderella. And it's a very sweet story that I wanna leave you with. It's so charming. I don't think I took away what she intended. I think her intended point was to say that if you get married, the bride's family and the bride are responsible for the entire expense of the wedding. I think that's an antiquated idea. I don't think that's really how weddings are done anymore. I think they're just done however the couple wants to do it. And I definitely say to each their own in that way. But this story totally illustrated the sweetest wedding and it just really drove home the old saying, money can't buy taste. And I don't even know if that's just a saying. I think that's a true statement. Money can't buy taste. And anything done with true and lovely intention and an eye for beauty can be done well on practically nothing. Now I'm gonna read you this last little story and hopefully you'll love it as much as I do. I think it's very sweet. The Wedding of a Cinderella. When the bride's family are not particularly well off, and how many families are not in this day? She means 1937. It is not only inadvisable to attempt expenditure beyond what they can afford, but they would lay themselves open to greater criticism through inappropriate lavishness than through moderate arrangement, which need not by any means lack charm or even perfection. Some years ago, there was an extremely fashionable wedding which will be remembered always by every witness in spite of, or maybe because of, its utter lack of costliness. It was a June day in the country. The invitations were by word of mouth to neighbors and personal notes to the groom's relatives at a distance. The village church was decorated by the bride and her friends with dogwood, than which nothing is more bride-like or beautiful. The shabbiness of her father's house was smothered with flowers and branches cut with an eye to pruning and not destroying the trees far back in the thickets of a neighboring wood. Her dress, made by herself, was of tarlatan covered with a layer or two of tulle, and her veil was of tulle fastened with a spray, as was her girdle of natural bridal wreath and laurel leaves. Her bouquet was of trailing bridal wreath and white lilacs. She was very young and divinely beautiful and fresh and sweet. The toll of her dress and the veil and her thin silk stockings and white satin slippers represented the entire outlay of any importance for her costume. A little sister in a smock of pink sateen with a wreath and tight bouquet of pink laurel clusters toddled after her and held her bouquet after first laying hers down on the floor. The breakfast was as satisfying to the taste as the dresses of the bride and bridesmaid were to the eye. 
a homemade wedding cake, professionally iced, and big enough for everyone to take home a slice and wax paper piled near for the purpose, and a white wine cup were the most pretentious offerings. In addition, there were hot biscuits, cocoa, coffee, and scrambled eggs, and the music was a phonograph. The bride's going away dress was of brown holland linen, and her hat a plain little affair as simple as her dress. Again, her only expenditure was on shoes, stockings, and gloves. Later, she had all the clothes that money could buy, but in none of them was she ever more lovely than in her cloud-like wedding dress of tarlatan and tulle and the plain little frock in which she drove away. Nor are any of the big parties that she gives today more enjoyable, though perfect in her way, than her wedding on a June day a number of years ago. I think that's the sweetest little picture she paints of doing things tastefully without overextending your finances. So I thought that was another valuable little story that she put in her book. And there are a lot of them. Um, a lot of it is superfluous and arbitrary. She goes into detail about like dowries and things that we don't have anymore. But anyway, if you're interested, check out that book. It's a fun thing to listen to while you're putzing around the house. You can look it up on YouTube. Thank you for listening to these little nuggets that I found in this book. I hope you enjoyed them. I thought they were charming and helpful and kind of worth sharing. I've wanted to make this video for a long time. So definitely give it a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to my channel if you'd like to see more of my homemaking videos. And I'll see you next Sunday, friends. Bye for now. Mwah.